Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to Grace Church Leatherhead. My name is Bert Dean. I'm one of the members at this church. Uh, what a wonderful day to be meeting together to hear from God's word. So nice to have the sun shining as well. I think it brings a real difference. I love to see the awesome colours. A very warm welcome to Greg and his wife Gillian. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, Greg's going to be speaking to us a bit later on. Uh, Greg was at Oak Hill with John, um, so very good friends and uh, oversees a pastorate up in Glasgow and uh, John will be interviewing Greg in a little bit. If this is your first time, a very warm welcome to you. Um, please do stay around after the service. We've got tea and coffee. We have the added bonus of a, a vast array of drinks and um, food, which is uh, Addy bringing that on Stephen's birthday from yesterday. Stephen, very happy birthday to you, um, turning 18. Um, we thank you for bringing those along. Uh, and we hope you had a great day, and it'll be good to get to know you. As we um, come into the service today, um, I'd like us just to have a look at what well, I'm going to read from Micah, chapter 6. Uh, Micah was one of the prophets who lived at the time of three of Israel's kings. Um, if you've got any biblical knowledge, we know that the kings were either good or bad. They either followed God or they didn't. And in the time of Micah, there were three kings. There was um, Jotham, who walked with the Lord. Then there was Ahaz, who certainly didn't walk with the Lord. And then there was Hezekiah, who did walk with the Lord. So Micah lived at a time of quite an interesting uh, time in Israel's history. And uh, in the book of Micah, in chapter 6, uh, we read this. But as I read it, you know, it's at a time where Israel was offering sacrifices um, thinking that by offering sacrifices, that's where they find forgiveness. And yet, if their hearts were not right, it certainly wasn't going to be hitting the mark. But we read this in Micah chapter 6, verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of the, my body for the sin of my soul? I'll just explain that bit, because ultimately Ahaz was someone who sacrificed his son, thinking that that was going to be pleasing to the God that he worshipped. And yet we read this in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. As we come to hear from God's word today, I just, my prayer will be that we approach him humbly, that we see ourselves for what we are, and we see God for who he is. He made all things, he is mighty, and we are part of his creation. And yet, so often we think we know so much when we know so little. So I'm going to pray, and then just shortly after that, um, we'll have a moment of quiet, just to reflect on our own hearts, and then I'll ask the musicians to come up, and we'll pray. But I'll just open our time in prayer. Almighty God, we do thank you that we can meet together, that we can be in fellowship with one another, and how we can hear from your word. We thank you for the Bible, we thank you for the truth that it contains. We thank you, Lord, that you teach us through it by your Holy Spirit, and we pray that you will speak to our hearts, whether we are near or far from you today. Lord, we all have different lives and very busy lives, and we think at times that we know so much, and yet if we really focus on things, Lord, we see that we are nothing we are very insignificant but you are great and mighty and in you we find meaning and in you we find life and identity lord we thank you so much that we can come before you now to sing your praises and honor your name we pray lord just as we reflect on our own hearts now that we may have hearts that are humble before you and we ask this in jesus name amen so we'll just have a quick moment of quiet and then i'll ask the musicians to come up So now we're going to turn to God in song as musicians come up. Thanks, John.
bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Come see his hands and his feet, the scars that speak of sacrifice, hands that flung stars into space, to cruel nails surrender. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our a daily offering of worship to the servant king. So let us learn how to serve, and in our lives enthrone him, each other's going to go through some church family news just so everyone aware of what's going on a uh, message from Richard just so that songs of praise today is at 115 if people watch it but it's got a feature on cap so Richard obviously is our one of the key players in cap locally um, so that's on songs of praise today at 115 tonight we've got our AGM so that's at the Snellers house if you need any information about that please speak to me or Ian or John uh, it's meeting at 6.30 for members and then 7 o'clock for those who aren't members where we'll go through the agenda that's been sent out which hopefully most people have received. Next weekend, um, hopefully this will be on the notices as well, uh, Passion for Life is, uh, we had it a couple of weeks ago, I'll say a couple of weeks ago, um, at, um, I was going to say Chessington Evangelical Church, but they're now King's Church, Chessington. Um, so that was a Excellent evening. Um, I know a number of the youth went, a number of us went as well. Really encouraging time to hear about Passion for Life, uh, a mission program, uh, opportunity to evangelize in the area with other churches. So that's next Sunday evening, um, and many from the church will be going to that. Um, you'll find other notices and, and those notices within the service sheet that you've received today. Um, also, just a notice in relation to the current status of COVID. Obviously, this is something which uh, is very much in the news and uh, for John and Ian and the leadership team obviously we want to make sure that people feel as safe as they can be whilst they're in the service we are obviously listening to government advice and um, listening to FIEC and uh, various other groups to kind of gauge where and what we should be doing um, but we do just want to reiterate you know if people want to wear masks you're more than welcome to um, at any time um, within the service um, we're going to be looking at the seating as well. At the moment, you'll find a few seats at the back, which are slightly further back and spaced out. So, again, we want to just make sure that people are safe as well as feeling safe. We're not going to continue with a collection bag of being passed around. So that's obviously it's been here for two weeks. We're going to jump away from that. Um, but it is at the back. So if you do give um, through cash, then please do use that at the back um, and honour God in that way. And um, really, if anyone's got any concerns or any questions or please do come and speak to me, speak to John, speak to Ian. You know, I've written the risk assessment. Um, but ultimately, we want to make sure that we are keeping one another safe and looking out for one another. So please do um, raise any concerns with us. I'm now going to hand over to John, who's going to interview Greg. I've just forgotten one more, sorry. I was going to say, at the back, you'll also find uh, these little tracts, which are about Halloween, um, trick or treat obviously a gospel centered message in there halloween being next sunday where a lot of people could be moving around uh, knocking on doors great opportunity there just to make, give one of these as well 
And also we've got uh, a number of copies of John's Gospel as well, so please do take those if you do want that. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks. Great, I'm going to welcome Greg and Gillian up. Uh, but on those tracks, you know, th- this is the one time of year when people come to our, you know, it used to be Christians knocking on doors uh, and trying to evangelize. Now we have people co- coming and knocking on our doors. So it's a great opportunity. Those tracks are really helpful. If you Make sure you've got some sweets ready to give them, but give them one of those tracks as well and they can go away and read it. It's got a wonderful gospel message in it. So please do grab some of those. We've got, how many, Hillary? 50? 100? 100 of them at the back. So grab a few and, st- and put them in the bags that you give with the sweets. Right, I would love to introduce Greg and Gillian um, for... Uh, for us now. Excellent, we've got a spare microphone. Um, now, Greg and I met six years ago? Eight years ago. Eight years ago. Uh, it's like a marriage, you get it wrong and uh, they're really upset, wow. Uh, eight years ago at uh, Theological College in North London. Uh, and I think it's fair to say Greg and I kept each other sane there uh, with a bit of normality. Uh, so I, I think I've used this illustration before in one of my sermons. Greg was the guy, if you remember this illustration, who would, every so often the door would Back, um, I'd be in my study, the door would come flying open, I'd get a slap around the head, uh, and he would say, it's not about you, John. Uh, which except, I'd a- except I would do it in my accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'd asked him to do that to keep me kind of, you know, it's not about you, John, it's about God, that's why you're here. And Greg, Greg welcomed that uh, invitation to take on that responsibility. He did it very well. Uh, so, uh, so this is Greg and Gillian, very good friends of ours, and they're now up in, not Glasgow, Tell us how to pronounce Glasgow. 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 <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, we haven't got a translator with Greg this morning, so you're going to have to do your best. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, just, I noticed Bert said Glasgow, and that's how I say it too, but I think we need to hear it properly. Um, so Greg is in a, a part of Glasgow, Gla- well, yeah, Come however on. you say it, uh, in uh, Yoka. Gillian, tell us a little bit about Yoker in Glasgow. Yeah, so Yoker is in the west of the city. It's right on the River Clyde. It was a very industrious area, lots of shipyards, uh, a big Singer sewing machine factory. Um, Many of the shipyards have gone now, so it's quite a working class area. There's families, generations live in Yoker, round the corner from mum and gran. Um, And it's also kind of, there's newer developments where people are moving from the city to Yoker to get on the property ladder. Um, Yeah. Great. And uh, how have you found it living there and engaging with the community? I know you've been right at the heart of the community, haven't you, in lots of ways? Yeah, so just trying to get to know people. There isn't really anywhere that people seem to hang out, so I've tried to get involved in the school. We've got three children, um, Alistair, Ailey and Jonathan, so I'm on the parent council, which is like parent governors, school governors. Um, So getting to know people through that, through the toddler group, and uh, just things like trying to make sure we're shopping local so that we're bumping into the same people all the time. Brilliant, excellent. Um, I forgot my initial question, which is always the best question, uh, which we love to hear here. Is how did you both become Christians? Maybe start with start with Greg's and hear another voice. But Greg, how did you become a yeah. Christian? Um, I promised John that I would try and be brief. <laughs> so when I was born, no, <laughs> uh, actually it does go back to when I was born. Uh, my mum and dad weren't able to have kids, and my mum prayed that she uh, would be able to have a son. Um, and when they adopted me. Uh, the adoption agency phoned and said, we have a son for you. And my mum, who wasn't uh, a churchgoer, wasn't a Christian, just felt like this was an answer to a prayer that she'd prayed uh, to God, kind of, if you're there, I would love a son. Please give me a son. Um, and she promised that she would take me to church. So I started going to church when I was a kid, drifted away when I started playing rugby. Um, when I was 15, my mum became a Christian, and I noticed a huge change in her. It, um, everybody said at the time that her face just lit up she went from being quite a sad and tense lady who drank a little too much at the weekend uh, to a woman who was just bright and just exuded happiness. I noticed that. She started inviting me to church and I went along. And I would say, as I read the Bible, I just thought, this seems true. I'd always kind of believed in God. And just as I read the Bible, it kind of filled in lots of gaps. And I thought, actually, this is really important. And uh, when I was about 18, I realized it's not just enough to believe it. It's not just enough uh, to agree that it's true, but actually I need to follow Jesus. Um, and so when I was 18, I had, had to choose whether I was going to go my way or God's way. And I think that's the day I became a Christian. I said, I'm yours, Lord. Wonderful. We'll hear a little bit more about after that. But Gillian, how did you become a Christian? Uh, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were Christians. They took me to church since I was a baby. Um, always believed in God, always loved God 
always had the right answers. I was the one that wanted to <laughs> give the right answers at Sunday school. Um, I think maybe when I was about 12, I kind of realized that I had to make my own decision. It was God had died for me, not just as a result of like my parents. Um, so I guess through my teenage years, kind of working out what it meant for me to be a Christian and not just the one who had the right answers at church, kind of developing that relationship with God um, throughout my teenage years. Yeah. Great, thank you. It's always wonderful to hear, isn't it, how people come to faith. Um, so you became a Christian at 18, Greg, uh, and now you're a minister in Yoka. Very briefly, fill us in that little gap there. <laughs> Very briefly. Uh, I, when I became a Christian, I didn't want to do anything apart from talk to people about Jesus. Um, my friends who weren't Christians uh, very quickly told me that I now no longer talked about anything apart from Jesus, and they wanted me to talk about other things as well. Um, and I think that, that love for talking about God just meant that as I went through university, I was studying history, which, as you know, leads directly into a career path. <laughs> as I studied history, I thought... Actually, I don't want to do anything with my life apart from tell people about Jesus and talk about God. Um, and so I uh, condense. I ended up working for a church as a youth worker. I uh, did that for four years. Then I went to Oak Hill uh, to keep John right for three years uh, and to learn some stuff as well. And then uh, we went to Yoker. We've been there ever since. Amazing. Wonderful. Okay, so... Um, the reason I wanted to, Greg and Jean to join us here this morning was, well, partly as an excuse to see them and get them down here and, and spend the weekend with them, but more than that was for us as a church to consider a church on the other side of the UK in a very, very different area uh, to ours uh, and that we can be partnering with them, praying with them and maybe have them back again uh, in the future or maybe I might even go up there. Uh, that'd be lovely. Um, so I would love to begin that uh, today as we get to know them, as Greg preaches to us this morning, uh, to begin... Um, yeah, a partnership, a, a relationship with them. Uh, so, Greg, just give us a little bit more about uh, what church life looks like in Yoka. Yeah, so I suppose just a wee bit of background on the church. It's, it's been there for 100 years, over 100 years, but it started off life as a, a mission to the shipyards. So it was made up of members of different churches that came together in Yoka to preach the gospel uh, to the workers in the shipyards and a car factory and lots of different things. Um, in about the 70s or 80s, they'd realized that most of the, the mission members had drifted away from their churches uh, for various reasons and were actually treating the mission as their church. And so they transitioned at that point to being a, past to being a, a church and they uh, appointed a pastor and joined the FIEC. Uh, the church today, uh, there's about 60 of us um, on a Sunday morning. Um, a very wide range of folk. We've got members from Congo uh, and members from Yoker. <laughs> and we've got kind of really working class folk. We've got uh, more kind of middle class folk. We've got a really wide range. There's maybe a bit of a gap in terms of ages. We've got older folk who have been there for, some of them for 70, 80 years. Uh, and then we've got kind of younger folk who have just moved to the area or have just started coming to church. So it's very mixed in that way. Um, and give thanks, there's, I think probably the biggest encouragement for us at the moment is a lady called Leanne, hope she doesn't watch this and find out that I've said that, uh, but she came to faith about a year ago, um, she's just a very normal lady and she's come to, she's found Jesus and loves him and wants to keep growing in her faith and that's been so, so encouraging. Do you want a, prayer, a couple of prayer points? Yes please, that's what, my next question. Uh, um, I've interviewed people before as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... The main thing to pray for for us is this, is a kind of transition from the faithful old guard that have been faithfully and passionately leading the church, some of them for like 40, 50 years, uh, to a kind of younger group that quite, haven't quite stepped up yet. So at this moment, we're really struggling for leaders because we've got this kind of gap in between the two. And so we're trying to, I suppose, broaden that serving core uh, to bring in the younger ones. That would be a big thing. And the second would just be that we would be involved in the community and able to uh, reach out to tell people the good news of Jesus. Great. Thank you very much. Well, let's pray for them briefly now uh, before Greg later comes to preach to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Yoka Evangelical Church. Uh, we praise you for their faithful ministry over many, many years. We thank you for those who've come to know you through that ministry. And we pray, Lord, in this new time, uh, this uh, new season where they've got many who've been there for years and 
uh, a number who are new to the church, uh, who are of the younger generation. We do pray, Lord, that you would bless them in so many ways. We pray that they would gel as a church, they would be united in their faith uh, and support each other and uh, encourage each other in their walk with you. We pray, Lord, that you would raise up leaders who would lead that church, Lord, into uh, a new era, Lord, where we, they would see many come to know you. We pray that uh, they would all um, love you so much, just like this, this new lady who has uh, come to know you, Lord, that they would be overflowing with the joy of knowing you, that they'd want to share that with all around them. And we pray that they would be a blessing on that community. We pray for Greg and Gillian as they seek to lead the church there, Lord, that you would be with them, you'd give them the energy that they need, but you'd be working through them by your spirit, we pray. And we pray that as, uh, as a church, we would uh, love and, and support them in prayer as well, Lord, that we would consider how we can partner with them in the gospel, being uh, the other side of the country, Lord. Uh, we are brothers and sisters united in Christ, and we want to be united in the work together. So we pray you would help us to be those who support them in prayer and love them uh, in any way that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Appreciate that. Always so, song. We're going to sing again, so please stand when the music starts. Uh, during this song, the, those who need to go out to Croatia can go out to Croatia and Sunday school as well. So you can go out during that time. So musicians, if you care to come up, that would be fantastic. Morning church, let's stand and sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. My joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. Bye. 
today I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hope hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat everyone we're going to uh, turn to our God in prayer now so if you would join me O oh Lord you are God we seek you in all earnestness our souls thirst for you our bodies long for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water you are God and we will praise you our father's God and we will exalt you you are the true God the living God the only living and true God the everlasting King the covenant Lord, our God, who is one Lord. Father, we give you our thanks for your great plan of salvation. Uh, we've heard how this lady, Leanne, found salvation in Yoka, and we rejoice uh, with Greg and his church and uh, that new life. Um, but we would uh, seek that uh, your plan of salvation would be made plain in this place uh, so that there will be others who will uh, recognize you for who you are. We thank you for the gift of Jesus our Saviour, the one who takes away the sin of the world. We thank you that the gospel still goes out throughout this world. Uh, we thank you that uh, you've brought us through this past week uh, with all its challenges and pressures and some will be relieved to have reached the end of another week uh, but we thank you for uh, bringing us through. Father, you know we've been challenged about our evangelism in recent times and uh, we have been um, helped uh, this last uh, weekend with the staycation. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. May we too have compassion on those around who do not yet believe. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Father, would you guide us as we move forwards with our plans for this church and how we might witness to this community around, especially in, this, in the forthcoming Christmas season. May you help us to be friends to those around us. May you help us to uh, make contact with neighbors, to uh, those that we work with, to those that we meet at the school gates, uh, wherever we are in contact with people, may you help us to be truly your ambassadors. Father, as we sit in a uh, comfortable Leatherhead, in the comfortable Southeast, in the comfortable United Kingdom, we often forget that around us in the world uh, there are many who would seek to try to destroy Christianity. We know there is oppression going on throughout this world. We pray for God's people oppressed in this world. Strengthen their patience and their faith. Uh, we ask that you would help these suffering servants. Enable them to live in hope and quietly wait for your salvation. Do not let those who have been oppressed return in disgrace from their mistreatment. We're conscious, Father, of the regime in Afghanistan and as the news dies away that uh, the Taliban are in control, the oppression continues. And your people are uh, being mistreated. Your people are being oppressed. Your people are being uh, sidelined. We pray for those people in that land and uh, now the bordering areas of Pakistan where the Taliban there are also exerting their uh, efforts and uh, seeking to uh, control those areas. We pray for the Christian church there. We know 
is very small, uh, but uh, is still there working. We pray for all those involved in that. We pray for the state of India, and as laws are passed to criminalise conversions in ten of the states in India, we are concerned for your people. We are concerned that uh, uh, they will be marginalised and uh, pushed to one side. We pray that you will give them strength, that uh, your church would grow in those places where we so often do see that your church grows when there is great oppression. And we pray for those Christians in Myanmar, in that country of turmoil and uh, the army uh, seemingly in total control and uh, not willing to uh, uh, budge. And uh, we hear of Christians hiding in uh, forests and woods seeking uh, shelter. We pray for them as they seek to work out what uh, your will for them is in that place. We pray for those um, US hostages in Haiti, uh, the 17 of them. Uh, we ask that you would keep them safe, uh, that they would somehow be released without harm or rescued. We pray that your hand would be upon them and that they may be able to return to their homes and to their loved ones. Finally, Father, we pray for matters within this church. Uh, we pray for those who are unwell at this time. We think of Trudy. Uh, with her fall this week and her replacement hip operation as a consequence, we pray uh, that you would help Trudy as she recovers from that and help Rob as he looks after her. Uh, we pray that uh, uh, she would be um, discharged from hospital before long and be able to uh, come back to, to full health. We thank you for her brightness in her messages that we've heard of and uh, we uh, pray that she may continue to be supported by the church. We pray for Scylla and Judith, and we are delighted to see them here this morning. Uh, but we, we ask that they, they both would be helped in their recovery from uh, their difficulties that they've had recently. We pray for John and Ruth and their family. Uh, we lift them up to you and ask that you would deal kindly with them. You would help them as they lead uh, this church. We pray that you would uh, be good to them. And we ask now also for... Um, our workers uh, with the children, the youth workers and the children's workers as they teach the children. We pray in this age of uh, mixed and wrong messages in school uh, that um, the children may be given the clear truth of the Bible and that uh, the ideas of men would not penetrate uh, their minds but the Bible instead. And we pray for all of those in this church who are going through difficult circumstances at the present time. You know each one's circumstances we may know of some but we certainly don't know all and uh, we just lift up those who are just finding uh, each day a trial and a difficulty uh, we pray that they would look to you uh, they would keep fix their eyes on you uh, f as their friend helper and savior so our father we lift up all of these things to you and we do so in jesus name amen This morning's reading is from John chapter 1. I'll give you a minute to find it. So it's John chapter 1, starting at verse 19 to the end of the chapter. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are, you why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. 
The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Beth Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jules. Um, just, I never actually had a chance to say because John was too busy firing questions at me, but it's such a joy to be with you today. Um, I've been friends with John for eight years, even though he can't remember two of them, and, uh, and I've therefore been part of uh, his journey and Ruth's journey to come and to join you here in Leatherhead and I heard lots about you, all of it good, uh, and it's just so lovely to be able to spend some time with you. Um, Gillian said to me, this morning, remember to speak slowly. Now, I'm used to speaking to quite a, a, a crowd that doesn't mind interrupting me, we'll put it that way. So if at any point you're thinking, I missed that, just put your hand up and just say, I didn't get it. Can you go back and speak a wee bit slower, please? Um, I would rather do that rather than try and slow down. I think I speak quite, for a Glaswegian, I speak very well. <laughs> it's quite a caveat. <laughs> Okay, let's, just before we look at this uh, passage again, let's pray and ask for God's help. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are a speaking God and that you speak to us through your word and by your spirit. And we ask, Father, that as we look at John's gospel this morning, that you would minister to each one of us in the way that you know that we need. Please speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, and lead us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, there was a, an old pastor uh, who also wrote some books called A.W. Tozer. And one of the things that he wrote, as he said, Christians are amazing. They're 
amazing because they are the only people who can take the most exciting news that's ever been told and make it sound boring. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? We have the best message that's ever been told. And yet when we tell it, we go, I am <laughs> And I know last week John started this series in John's Gospel. And as it begins, it says, uh, the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That God, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, became human and was born in Bethlehem. That is phenomenal. When I know that He told you in John 20, verse 31, that John says at the end of the gospel, the reason I've written all these things is so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing, you might have life in his name. So it's not only a message about this amazing thing that's happened, that God the creator has become a human being, but it's also a message that has an impact in every single human being's life. If they believe in him, they will have life, eternal life in his name. How can we make that boring? And yet we do. So often we find it so difficult and we, we try and share and we, our words get muddled. We try and tell people why we love Jesus and it, it just kind of fritters away and they look at us like we're a wee bit odd. I think the reason is because we don't see as we should. We don't see Jesus for who he is. If I had tried to share with that excitement who Jesus is and what it means that he's been born, now that I've been a Christian for more than six months, I would find that really difficult. Even me, I'm a pastor. Still hard. But it's the best news that anyone's ever had. And so this morning, as we look at this passage, I want us, most of all, to come and see. To see more of who Jesus is. To wonder about him coming into this world. To wonder about what's revealed as he starts his ministry on this earth. And then I want us to see that going and telling is just pointing other, others to Jesus. So come and see, go and tell. But really, go and tell is just saying to other people, you come and see as well. And we'll see how people started to do that as we go through the passage. But as it begins, the setting that this takes place is where, if you look at verse 28, it says, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. So John, often known as John the Baptist, was baptizing people who came to him. And baptism at that time was something which was done by some sects of Judaism. But it was often done just for those who were uh, either uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, who were wanting to become Jews, or wanting to become God-feeders, as they were called, or to Jews who had kind of gone away from the faith, who had done something horrendous and they wanted to come back to God. And they would be baptized as they came back to God. But John is baptizing people who are in good standing in the community. He's telling them to come out and to be baptized. And the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders at the time, are thinking, why? What are you doing? And on whose authority are you doing this? You're separate from us, the religious leaders and teachers. So on whose authority are you doing this? And so they come to him, verses 19 and onwards, it says, and this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? We're told he confessed freely and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He said, you've come out here because you're wondering, is this the Messiah? And straight away, John says, I am not the Christ. That's not who I am. So they start guessing other people that had been prophesied in the Old Testament, those who were to come before the, the, the Messiah, the great Messiah was to come. And they say, well, so are you Elijah? He says, no. He says, well, are you the prophet that's promised? He says, no. And now they've run out. And they're like, oh, well, who are you then? Who's left? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Verse 22. And it's here that John says, my task is very simple. My task is super simple. He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. He said, my task is just to be a voice in the wilderness, 
saying, the Lord's coming. Make straight his way. Clear a path. Here he comes. In, in the Transport Museum in Glasgow, there's a train that just looks like any other steam train. And I remember just reading the plaque on it. And I thought, this train's amazing. This train, its task was always to go ahead of the royal train. So anytime the queen or the king was going anywhere in the country, they would take the train. And this train would go about a mile or two, I can't remember, I can't remember the plaque, but a mile or two ahead. And its job was just to steam through stations, going, toot, toot, the queen is coming, the queen is coming. Make way, everybody off the tracks, everybody brush your hair, the queen's coming. So this train steams ahead, and I think John the Baptist is a bit like the train. He's coming, he's saying, make way, clear the path. The king is coming, the Lord is coming. That's his task. And it builds excitement, doesn't it? Imagine if you were on a platform, and you were, you were just, I don't know, waiting for your train. And this herald train, as we'll call it, this herald train comes steaming through, beep, beep, and announcing the queen is on her way. You think, oh, oh, stand a wee bit straighter and wait for the queen to pass. Even as a Scotsman, I would do that. There's not many of us. But you, you, you get ready, don't you? There's an expectancy. And you're thinking, is it going to be now? Is it going to be in a minute? Five minutes? I'll wait here until she comes. And I think that expectancy starts to build with John, doesn't it? He says, I'm the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. And the bit he's quoting from Isaiah is from Isaiah chapter 40, where the book of Isaiah turns. So the book of Isaiah talks about the, the travel into exile as the Jews leave the, the promised land. It gets more and more miserable as it goes on. And there's a few high points, but generally the trajectory is down. And chapter 40 is the turning point. And in chapter 40, we have this line, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah says, that God is going to come and he is going to restore all things. And he's saying, that's the moment we're in. Prepare yourselves. Prepare the way. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but among you stands one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He says, I baptize with water, but after me comes one who is so much greater that I can't even describe in words. And look with me at what he says. I want you to build this anticipation for this one that's to come. You see in verse 26, he says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now, I want you to think now, is there anyone on this planet that you don't think you're worthy to untie their shoes? Think about it for a minute. There's nobody, is there? And in those days, it was seen as a really lowly job even more lowly than it would be just now for me to untie someone's shoes. Because people walked about in sandals and there was animals in the street and hygiene wasn't as good and it was dusty. So feet got dirty. And actually for a disciple, the only job that they weren't to do for their rabbi, their teacher, was to untie their shoes. It was the lowest job. And John says here, he says, the one who's coming is so much greater, so much greater than me. I am not worthy to untie his shoes. Not worthy to untie. I mean, as I said, strange for a Scotsman, I have quite a high view of the monarchy. I think she is our queen and I respect her. But even we Greg from Yoker, I think is worthy to untie her shoes. Would you say so? I don't think that there's anyone in this land that if you said, would you please untie the queen's shoes, would say, oh no, no, that is far too high an honor for me to do. But John says there's one who comes after him who is so great that he is not worthy to untie his shoes, smelly though they are. The anticipation grows and grows, doesn't it? And then, verse 29 to 34, we see, behold, behold, you see who is coming. You see this one that John has spoken about. Verse 29 says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is still doing it. Instead of saying, there's one coming that you can't yet see, now he's pointing and saying, there he is. 
If we do it now, if I just do it, okay. Look, Who's, who was still looking at me? Hands up. Oh, you ruined it. But most of the time, if somebody goes, look, you look as well, don't you? You want to see what they're pointing to. And that's what, that's what John does here. He says, behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one. This is the one I've been talking about. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he starts to unpack even more about who Jesus is, why he's amazing, what it is about him that's so wonderful. And he begins with this, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you've got a Bible there, you can flick to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, if, you, if you want to not flick, I'll read it for you. But from verses 4 to 7 in Isaiah 53, we see uh, something of what I think uh, John is trying to unpack about who Jesus is. In Isaiah 53, he says, Surely he, that's a prophecy about Jesus, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, the lamb of God, came to take away the sin of the world, to bear the punishment that should have been ours, to make us clean, not just so that we could have uh, our guilt taken away, which we know can be so crushing, but also so that we would be made holy and able to come to God. That's why he came. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin not only of the Jews, but of the world. Every single person who puts their hope and trust in Jesus has their sins taken away so that they can come to God. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But that's not all. He goes on to tell us that the reason he came baptizing with water was so that this one would be revealed. This one that was to come. See that in verse 31. And he's told that he will see the Spirit of God descend and remain on the Messiah, the one who is to come. And that this one, because the Spirit remains on them, he is the one who is able to give the Spirit of God to others as well. He won't baptize with water, he will baptize with the Spirit, giving people that relationship with the living God that can only come through him. And then 34 finishes by saying, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is, wait for it, the Son of God. How awesome is this one who is coming after John? This one who is pointing to and saying, behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one who has the power and authority to give you the Spirit of God in you, to give you life. And this is the one who is the Son of God of God. It's phenomenal. And then we see that this expands, doesn't it? It doesn't stay with just John saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but it, it continues into other people. The news starts to spread. Other people take up John's ministry. Let me tell you a wee story. John told me I had to do the accent, and I have to warn you, it, it might not be a good accent. But it'll probably sound good to you because it's a Scottish one and you go, that's fine. But one of my friends, when he was just training to be a minister, he was uh, invited back to Lewis. He was from Harris, Outer Hebrides. He was invited back to Lewis to preach. And the church he was preaching in was uh, quite odd in some ways because it had two auditoriums. It had a, a Gaelic service auditorium and an English service auditorium. Uh, Gaelic Scots for Gaelic. People sometimes don't say Gaelic. If you're ever talking about the Scots language, say Gaelic. It's not Gaelic. Anyway, uh, and so they had a Gaelic service and an English service. And they had one vestry for both ministers before they went out to preach. And John was there. He was in his early 20s, just brand new to preaching. And there was an old boy who was going to be preaching to the Gaelic service, a kind of retired minister. 
And this is where I'm going to try and do the accent. And he turned to John and he said, So, John, we continue the ministry. <laughs> I was going Irish. <laughs> try again. I did it last night. Perfect. He said, So, John, get me a help. John McLeod from the island of Lewis. Anyway, he said, So, John, we continue the ministry of John the Baptist. And John kind of looked at him quizzically, like, What do you mean? He said, we continue the ministry of John the Baptist. We go and we say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's definitely gone Irish. <laughs> but that's the thing. He's saying, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He said, that's the ministry of all Christians always. It's always been what we've been about. We're continuing the ministry of John the Baptist. And that's what we see in this passage. The ministry of John the Baptist expands to other people. It bursts out. Look in verse 35. It says, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And in case anybody was around who hadn't heard him before, he looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He just said, behold, the Lamb of God. But then notice two of John's disciples are with him. Verse 37, the two disciples of John heard him say this and they followed Jesus. How wonderful is that? that John's disciples, his guys, hear him say, Behold the Lamb of God. And they go, see you, John. And they go and follow Jesus. Because they realize this is what John has been all about. He is a herald of this one. Don't keep following John. It's not about him. It's about the one he's been pointing to. So these two disciples start to follow Jesus. And Jesus turns to them and says, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? What are you after? What are you seeking? I don't know if it's because they didn't really know what to say or what they were looking for, but they said, uh, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and see. He could have said, oh, I'm staying uh, fourth house on the right, just past the river. But he didn't. He said, come and see, come with me. And so they follow Jesus. They go with him. They go and they see and it goes on in verse 39 saying, so they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour, which is about 4 p.m. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He started following Jesus, but then look what Andrew does next. Verse 41, he first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. We found him. We have found the Messiah. I think technically Jesus found them, but he said, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought Simon Peter to Jesus. He said, we've found the Messiah. Come here. You need to meet him too. You need to see him as well. He brought him to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and he said, so you are Simon, son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. So now we have Andrew and Peter. And then we see that it starts to spread again. In verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. So Jesus finds Philip and he says, follow me. And what's the first thing Philip does? Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael. And he said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth. It's, it's, Philip continues that process, doesn't he? As soon as he is found by Jesus, as soon as he finds Jesus, his immediate response is to go and get someone else. Here, Nathaniel, you need to come see. You need to come. We've found the one who was promised in the Old Testament, in the law, the books of Moses, in the prophets. Everything in the Old Testament is pointing towards this Messiah. And we found him. Come. Sorry, my throat's given up. But did you see what he said? He said, we found him, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What's Philip's response? Uh, Nathaniel's response, sorry. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of, is it Nazareth or Galilee? Hmm? Nazareth. Is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He said, is it possible for anything good to come out of Nazareth? Now, I don't know this area that well. So you might have to just fill in the blanks. But I'll tell you, there's an area just outside Glasgow called Greenock. 
and it records the highest level of rainfall in the whole world. <laughs> no, in Scotland. It's got the highest level of rainfall in Scotland. It used to have a glue factory where they melted the bones of horses to make glue. It had shipyards. The place was stinking and it rained all the time and everybody was miserable. And in some ways, when I hear Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I kind of think of Greenock. And I imagine you can think of somewhere else. It's like Jesus, the son of Joseph from Greenock. Huh? He says, can anything good come out? But then what does Philip say? He says, I know you don't believe. Come and see. Do you see that? What verse are we in? Verse 46, end of verse 46. Philip said to him, come and see. And in some ways, I think almost the gospels could have ended there. They've kind of, everything's been accomplished in some ways, hasn't it? It's revealed who, got, who Jesus is, why he's come, what his mission is. John the Baptist has prepared the way. Jesus has burst onto the scenes and people have started to go and spread the good news and move into the book of Acts. Yes? No, is the answer. No, there's a whole gospel of John to come. Why? Well, because there's more. There's more to see, more to know, more that's amazing. And we see that in the final section uh, from verse 47 onwards. Nathanael comes to Jesus and meets him. And Jesus says to him, uh, verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? You've never laid eyes on me before in your life. How on earth would you know that I am an Israelite in whom there is no deceit? This is, how possibly could you say that? And Jesus replies in verse 40, uh, 48. He says, before Philip called you, when you were under the, fig, under the fig tree, I saw you. Philip hears this and he's like, how on earth does he know that when Philip came to find me, I was under a fig tree? And Philip very quickly believes in Jesus. Nathaniel, sorry. Nathaniel very quickly believes in Jesus. And he answers him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, really? You believe that easily? He said, if you believe that easily, there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more to see. He says, because I saw, said I, to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's a reference to the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, in chapter 28. And it says, it's there where Jacob, I'll just tell it from my memory because it'll be a wee bit quicker. Jacob is the, uh, one of the patriarchs. He was the one whose name was changed to Israel. He was the father of the nation of Israel. And he was out in the wilderness just at the beginning of his adult life. And God brought a vision to him where he saw angels going up and down a staircase to heaven. And he saw God at the top. And he thought, this is the most amazing place that I've found. This is the house of God. This is the gate of Israel, the gate of heaven. He said, I think I've found the way into heaven right here in the place that became known as Bethel. And actually, what, what was happening there was God was saying, no, you are going to be the gate of heaven. Through your descendants is going to be the gate of heaven, the way open to God. And what Jesus is saying here is that Nathaniel will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, the title Jesus uses for himself. And he said, and actually, what you're going to see in the coming years is that I am the gate of heaven. That I am the way to God. He says, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see greater things, more things that will increase your faith and enable you to go and tell better. And really the whole of John's gospel as you walk through it in the coming months is going to reveal more and more of Jesus as you come and see more of who he is. And in the end, it will culminate on the cross of the Lord Jesus where the Lamb of God dies in our place on the cross, taking our guilt and sin upon himself so that we could be washed clean, so that our sin can be taken away. And not only will he die on the cross for our sin, but on the third day he will rise again, the firstborn from among the dead. 
and he'll rise again so that he can lead all others who will put their trust in him into eternal life in heaven with him and his Father and the Holy Spirit. It's wonderful news. It's better news than anything that's ever been told. And I think Jesus says to us today, he says, I want you to do two things. I want you to come and see and I want you to go and tell. And I think if it was in font sizes, I think the come and see would be in font size 142 and go and tell would be in font sizes 40. He said, because when you come and see, you will be just like Philip and Andrew who want to tell others. Andrew heard from John, I need to get Peter. Philip heard from Jesus, I need to tell Nathaniel. And that's been going on from generation to generation for 2,000 years. Somebody told you about Jesus, didn't they? Yeah, it's the only way you know. And, he's, and, and because of who Jesus is, when we see him as he is, we want to tell others. Now this morning, you might not be a believer or follower of Jesus. You might be here and you're just thinking, Whew, who is a Scotsman? <laughs> but I suppose the thing I would love for you coming away from here is that you have seen something of Jesus that attracts you. Something of Jesus that you think, he seems amazing. If that guy's even half right, this guy's worth looking into. And it, uh, Bert, <laughs> I struggled to get your name there, Bert, sorry. Bert said at the beginning, there's some John's Gospels at the back there. Take one, read it. Read through it and see who Jesus is revealed to be by one of the eyewitnesses of his life. Speak to someone in the church and say, actually, I'm going to read through this John's Gospel. Would you mind reading it with me just to help me? Come and see. See more of who Jesus is. And my prayer is that you, just like Andrew and uh, Peter and Philip and Nathaniel and thousands and millions of people since, will also see how amazing Jesus is and want to follow him all your life. Perhaps today you are a Christian. And as I introduced this and said, uh, this is going to be about coming and seeing and going and telling you, thinking we've been hearing that last week and I'm not good at it. And it doesn't matter what you say, Greg, I'm still not going to be good at it. I don't like telling people about Jesus. I find it difficult. Can I challenge you? You don't want to be challenged, but I'm going to challenge you anyway. Can I challenge you to look at this sermon again this afternoon or even just, just now think, is there one thing about Jesus from this passage that amazes you? And spend time thinking about it. Why does it amaze me? What is it about Jesus in this passage that's amazing? What is it about this story in the Bible that amazes me? Spend time so that it gets right deep inside you. And then think, who would I love to share that with? Who would I like to share that with? And pray for the courage to do it and, and tell people about who Jesus is. Why you think he's amazing. And invite them to come and see. Say, you can come to my church, Grace Church Leatherhead. It's okay, the crazy Scotsman's been. It'll be normal people again. He says, come, come and find out more about Jesus. You need to know him. Or maybe you want to take a, two John's Gospels and say to a friend, do you want to read this with me? Do you want to see more of who Jesus is? Because I think he's worth getting to know. But ultimately, I want us, all of us, to see more of who Jesus is, to see who he is in the flesh as he walked on the earth, to know why he came and what he came to do, and to know that he is now seated at the right hand of God, and he is the gate of heaven. He is the way to God, so, and through him, our sins can be washed away. So shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you so much that it reveals to us who Jesus is and that in it we can see him. That we, just like uh, Nathaniel and uh, Philip, just like Andrew and Peter, we too can see Jesus. We ask, Father, that you would fill our vision, that we would see him more and more and more and that we would wonder at how wonderful he is. And Lord, we ask that you would help that to overflow out of our mouths as we go to tell others about who he is and why we love him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Greg. Wonderful. Um, I think it'd be really good now to spend some time uh, maybe just reflecting on, on that passage just quietly for a moment. 
And then we're going to sing a new song. So we're going to sing the first verse and chorus. The song is called Behold the Lamb. It's an opportunity in that first verse and chorus to do that very thing, to behold the Lamb, to, to read those words, to reflect. Uh, and then it'd be great if we could join in together once having heard the first verse and chorus uh, and proclaim uh, that wonderful news together. So let's uh, maybe sit whilst uh, John uh, sings the first verse and chorus, reflecting on the words we've just heard, and then we'll stand together and join in from the beginning again. see the light of morning the mighty God the Prince of Peace a child to us is born behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin behold the Lamb of God the life of light and man. Behold the Lamb of God who died and rose again. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away our sin. Why don't we stand church and sing together? We who walk in darkness deep now see the light of morning. The mighty God, the Prince of Peace, a child to us is born. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. Behold the Lamb of God, the life and light of man. Behold the Lamb of God, who died and rose again. Behold the Lamb of God, who comes to take away our sin. Wanderers in the wilderness, oh, hear a voice is crying. Prepare the way, make straight the paths, your King has come to die. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away our sin. Behold. Behold. 
Have a seat. So, as we come to the close of the service, I'll pray. Please do stay around. It'd be great to chat. If this is a, a new message for you and you want to talk to anyone about it, please speak to John, Greg, Ian, myself. More than happy to talk and pray. What a great challenge. Let's um, turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, creator of all, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son into this world for a purpose. We all are like sheep. We have all gone astray. We have all gone in our own direction. And yet you sent the perfect shepherd to bring back your sheep. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he came into this world as a perfect sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that through him, and his death, we can have freedom, we can have redemption, we can have meaning, we can have an eternal life that cannot be taken away from us, no matter what is thrown at us in this life. Lord, we pray this week, this day, this hour, you will open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is. That we may see this as the best news in our lives, that we want to go out and tell people about how great you are, how you have provided a way. Lord, may we go from this place beholding the Lamb of God who takes away our sin and the sin of the world. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for this message. We thank you for this time together now in Jesus' name. Amen.